Well, it's good to see everybody again. Thanks for being here. Um, if you brought your Bibles, please get them out. Uh, turn them on if they're electronic. Head on over to Colossians uh, chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Not the usual, typical Easter Sunday uh, passage, but it's, uh, it's going to make sense, trust me. So here at Freedom Church, we are fascinated with the person and work of Jesus Christ. Everything we think, say, do, and feel lines up with Him, lines up with His character, lines up with His commands, lines up with just Him uh, as a person. And so today we're really going to look at how Jesus is our living hope, and he's our living hope because he is our way maker. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing that popular song, Waymaker. You do not want me singing, and I don't want to sing if I want you to come back. But today's passage, it's really fascinating because the Apostle Paul is writing to this church, and as, as is his usual custom, Paul is saying thank you, thank you, thank you. And so let's start in verse 11. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 11 it says we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need may you be filled with joy always thanking the father he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son do you hear what just happened He's transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Now you have to imagine Paul sitting in this little room with some of his friends around him, and, and he's writing this, and you can, you can feel the tears just dripping off of his face as he's writing about Jesus Christ. And then in verse 15, he just explodes into song. Verses 15 through 20 are, are usually considered <clears throat> the, one of the earliest Christian hymns because it points to the significance of Christ. This, Christ's death, life, or I'm sorry, Christ's birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, that's the moment that history had been waiting for. Everything in history and life points to Jesus Christ. His life, when he was born, it, and we celebrate that at Christmas, and then he lived for 33 years, and then on Good Friday, <clears throat> Jesus Christ went to the cross, was nailed to it, <coughs> and he suffered and died for us. I have a feeling my voice is going to go. <clears throat> Lord, give me strength. And you and I, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we've been transferred from that kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And it is our responsibility to bring the light and love of Christ to this dark world. Because we still live in a world that's spiritually dark. We still live in a world that's ruled by darkness and so we need to be salt we need to be light we need to colonize earth with the life of heaven so we're going to see as paul bursts out here in song and writes this beautiful poem we're going to see that jesus is our living hope hope and these first verses 15 to 19 point to, to the deity of christ christ is the visible image of the invisible god he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. This idea that Christ is the, the, the image of the invisible the visible image of the invisible God. This idea of him being an image is, is basically a replica of an illumination of, of God's inner core and his essence. He, in very essence, was God. And he existed before. He was firstborn. He was supreme. This means that he was 
he had priority in time. See, Jesus was not a created being. Jesus was eternal. Always has been and always will be. So he's the firstborn priority in time. He was also supremacy in rank. So he's not only the, the firstborn in time, even though he wasn't born, he's always existed. It's like right now. And don't worry, I'm not going to talk politics, especially on Easter. But we have a first lady, don't we? Dr. Biden. Now, personal feelings aside, was she the first woman that was ever born? No. But she still has the title of first lady. So she's first of woman, if you would, first lady. So when it says that Jesus was the firstborn, it's not that he was born. It's just that he's supreme. And that's what it means. You see, Jesus, this song goes on to explain that Jesus is the architect of creation, that he made the things we see and the things that we can't see. He's also, he's the architect, he's the builder, and he's the goal of creation. At the end of verse 16, it says, everything was created through him and for him. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we read really fast, don't we? This passage requires you to slow down. Because what does it mean that creation was made for Jesus? That he created creation for him? It means simply that this is his universe. It means that when he, when Jesus created the tree and gave it a, a, a particular leaf, put it in a particular place, he did that for a reason, for him. Do you ever wonder why a platypus looks the way that it looks? Jesus wanted it to. Do you know what the crown jewel in God's creation was? People, which means you are created exactly how God wants you. He's given you spiritual gifts. He's given you heart passions. He's given you abilities. He's given you a unique personality. If you're an introvert, fellow introverts, raise your hand. Stop apologizing for being introverts. If you're an extrovert, raise your hand. Stop trying to make us be introverted. <laughs> You've been given experiences, right? God has designed you the exact way that you are for a reason. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants a relationship with you. And don't forget that you, as his created being, as you, as someone made in the image of God, were made for a purpose. And that purpose was to bring glory and honor to Jesus. Amen? Amen. So don't ever lose sight of that for. He's the sustainer. He holds all creation together. When I was in the military, I worked uh, on GPS, and there's a, a highly classified portion of GPS. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell you everything. But it, it, it's called the Nuclear Detonation Detection System, NDS. And that was the system that I worked on. Um, and that's where I have to stop talking about what I did. But when you look at what a nuclear bomb does, it splits atoms. And when an atom is split, an incredible power is released. That's why nuclear bombs are so dangerous. When it says in here, in verse 17, that he being Jesus existed before anything else, he holds all creation together. The amount of power that goes into holding atoms together is incredible. And Jesus, as the creator and sustainer, is holding all of that power in. He is releasing power and holding it in for, ex for whatever purpose that he has for it. That is true power. If you've never seen a nuclear explosion, just go to YouTube and type in nuclear, scroll down a few, get to the good stuff. But he holds all of that together. And because Jesus sustains all of life, and this is important, no one is beyond the reach of his love and care. If you've ever had a son or a daughter or a grandchild walk away from the faith or walk away from, from life, love, all of that, keep praying. Keep praying 
praying, keep pursuing, keep sending them scripture, keep texting them, because nobody is outside of the reach of God's power, grace, mercy, and love. Amen? Verse 18, it says that Christ is head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. He's the head of the church. He's the beginning. He has authority. He has power. And in spite of our rebellion, Christ's purposes and plans prevail. This idea of Christ being preeminent means that his guidance, his direction, his control is what we need to be searching for. The leadership team here at Freedom Church Every time we go into a meeting, anytime we talk about the church, we start with talking about how we are seeking the mind of Christ. It's not my ideas. It's not our leadership team's ideas. It's not, it, we want the mind of Christ because Christ is preeminent. Christ is first. Christ is above all. He should be first in all of our thoughts, in all of our activities. So my question to you is Christ preeminent in your life is Christ number one and if he's not you often hear people say it's time for a come to Jesus moment <laughs> it's time for a come to Jesus moment because here's the deal Christ is sovereign over all anyway Christ is in control anyway. So when you lean into and when you trust Christ's leadership in your life, whatever area that may be, you're really just recognizing his proper place. And this happens in every, every area of your life, relationships, finances, work, whatever it happens to be, Christ needs to be preeminent. Then in verse 19, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. This idea of God being pleased to live in Christ, to dwell within Christ, that, that word is a permanent dwelling. And I really wish I could geek out on you because there's a really cool theological term for this verse. It's called kenosis, which is just simply self-emptying. Um, but I'm not going to do that. That would be really fun. <laughs> But the bottom line of these verses is that Christ has absolute authority over everything. And then we get to the verse that I want to focus on today, verse 20. And through him, through Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. On Good Friday, when... Jesus had gone through his trials that week. He had, <clears throat> he had had the last supper with his disciples. Jesus, and he had been in the garden praying for strength for his disciples, praying for God to take his, the cup of wrath away. But then he ultimately submitted, not your will, but my will be done. He knew the cross was coming. And you and I, we can say the cross matters. The cross, the cross, the cross. We've made it something beautiful, haven't we? We wear it around our necks. The cross was an instrument of torture. It's like the electric chair, but a lot worse because it lasted for hours and sometimes days. And I, when I first became a Christian, when I was a kid growing up in church, I was like, why? Why was that necessary? Why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Can't God just say your sins are forgiven and they're forgiven? The answer is no. Hebrews talks about without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And you should ask the question, well then, what does that mean? It means that God is a righteous judge, that God is holy. And when you and I sin, when you and I say, do, think, or feel something that is counter to the commands or character of God, that is called sin. That could be not listening to your parents. And all the parents said, all right? That could be disobeying your teachers. That could be uh, cheating on your spouse. That could be uh, excessive use of, of alcohol, drugs. Uh, it could be addictions to pornography or drugs or whatever it happens to be. Anything that goes against... 
Husbands and wives, when you don't treat your significant other with love and respect, that is sin. And in order for that sin to be paid for, a sacrifice had to be made. And you and I, we're not capable of making that sacrifice. And that leaves God with two choices, doesn't it? The first choice is God can lower his standard and say, okay, well, they said they're sorry, that's good enough. Or, because God desires a relationship with you, because God desires a relationship with me, because God loves everybody, he can say, you know what? My standard is going to stay the same, and I am going to come to earth, and I am going to die the perfect death. I am going to be that sacrifice once and for all, so that by Christ shedding his blood for you and I, all of our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. Amen? Amen. Amen. I thought you guys had died for a second there. All right. (laughs) But when Christ did that, we were reconciled. And this word reconciled means to restore a right relationship, to have harmony with God and harmony with one another. It makes us whole and it gives us a purpose. But here's the deal. God does not need to be reconciled to us because God did not do anything wrong. We need to be reconciled to him. And that's what we cannot do on our own. That's why Jesus is our living hope, because Jesus is the way maker. Jesus is the one that has cleared the way so that we can have a relationship with him, so that we can be reconciled to him. So God doesn't lower his standard. We don't rise to meet it. God initiated. God's loving hand is outstretched towards you and towards me. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. No longer counting your sins against you. Woo! And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's agents. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. You are an ambassador. You are an agent. You are the light and love of Jesus Christ. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Christ's blood on the cross. The real physical death of Jesus was on our behalf. It was real. It happened. Jesus is the way maker. Verse 21. Andrew, you said that last song that you sang makes you cry. This is the verse that gets me. This includes you. You. This includes me who was once far from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless, and you stand before him without a single fault. Everybody deep breath in out Jesus gave you the breath of life Jesus has forgiven you you just need to believe and I know some of you may be thinking there's no way it's that easy there's no way that Pastor Scott if if you knew everything that I had been through there is no way that God can just say It is finished, it is done, and all I have to do is believe. There's no way that I don't have to try to make things right with God. You don't. You don't. I know a lot of people in this room. I know a lot of your pasts. You know a lot of my pasts. And yet we gather together and we sing because we are a forgiven people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Before we came to believe in Jesus Christ, we were alienated. And when you and I think of people that are far from God, 
Oftentimes we think of those maybe who are morally far from God, right? Who are sinning, who are going against God's commands, who are still rebelling, who are doing things their own way, right? But there's more than just moral alienation from God. There's mental alienation from God. This is where people in their minds, even when they're confronted with the truth, they just can't believe it. And, and so that's why when I'm having conversations sometimes with people, I, I can kind of see early on if, the, if it's a mental or a moral thing that's keeping them from God. And if it's mental, I just ask them, if you work to come to the reality that what I'm saying about Jesus Christ is true, would you believe it? And they say, even if I knew it was true, I wouldn't believe it. Well, then, okay. You're mentally alienated from God. And so our job as followers of Jesus is to, we have that ministry of reconciliation, so we point to Jesus. We tell people about Jesus. And this idea that, that before we know Christ, before we believe Him, before when we were far from Him, we were enemies, that's a very personal thing. And one thing I want to remind you of is that this idea of reconciliation, it's more than just getting access to heaven. A lot of people think, yeah, I believed. I, a long time ago, I prayed a prayer. I was baptized. Whatever it happens to be, I'm good. I'm going to heaven, and I can do whatever I want right now. You're, my ticket's been punched. And if you genuinely believed in Jesus, you're right. But God still wants obedience. God still wants faithfulness. God still wants you to read his word and to do what it says. God still wants you to be nice to one another. Just because you're a follower of Jesus doesn't give you a right to be a jerk. Amen. Amen. So everybody that just said amen has a story about a Christian who was a jerk to them. Amen, amen right? Amen. But here's the deal. When we are saved, when Jesus Christ saves us, when we believe in Jesus Christ, he also gives us a desire to be made holy, to be blameless, and to be above reproach. And that's the end of verse 22. As a result, he's brought you into his own presence. And in the presence of God, you have to be holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single thought. You see, we are all going to stand before God someday. We are all going to be judged. And if you believe, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you can do so with the confidence that when, Christ, when God the Father stands to judge you, he is not going to see you. He is going to see his son, Jesus Christ. So because God meets us all the way, he is our judge. We are guilty. We need forgiveness and justification, and that's provided through Christ. God is also our friend. When you and I damage the relationship with him through sin, he provides the reconciliation that we need. And then verse 23, but you must continue to believe this truth. And stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world. And I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. Once you believe, your ticket to heaven's been punched. But now God has a whole list of work for you to do. And that list of work that he has for you to do, you know what it is? It's people's names. It's a community that he puts you in, that he wants you to love, that he wants you to be a part of. In 2 Corinthians 5, uh, we read 18 through 20 earlier, but here's what verse 21 says. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So what do I want you to do in light of today's passage, in light of this beautiful hymn, in light of this truth about reconciliation? First of all, I want you to receive that reconciliation. If you've never trusted Christ, if you've never believed that what he did was sufficient for your sins, if you've been trying to work your way to God, then just stop and cry out to God and say, Father God, I need to be forgiven. Thank you for Jesus. Receive that reconciliation. The second thing, if you're here today and you've kind of been wondering in your faith, you're, you've kind of stepped away, you're living outside of community, you know that you're not following God's design for you or God's shape for you, God's plan for you, then guess what? It's time to be reconciled to God as well. Come back to God. Be reconciled. Recommit your life to faithful obedience. Find a church home. Find a faith family that is committed to the word of God and committed to one another. The final thing I want you to do is I want you to be thankful. 
2 Corinthians 9.15 says this, Thank God for this gift, which is too wonderful for words. Other translations, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. And when you get a gift, it's useless until you open it. Jesus Christ is a gift. You open it by being obedient. Amen.